Good morning. It is a good day to be able to worship Him. I always say if I'm breathing, it's a good day to worship Him. The Bible says, let every breath, every man that has breath, praise His name. So if you're breathing, you are to praise Him. We were talking this week, my husband and I, that said, you know, the Bible says that if we don't praise Him, He will cause the rocks and the trees to praise Him. I don't know about you, but I don't want a tree to outdo me. So this morning, right where you are, in your living room, in your bedroom, in the kitchen, I don't care where you are, just, just lift up a, a voice of praise to Him today. Lift your hands up right where you are and just thank Him for giving you another day. Amen? Father God, we love you and we praise you. And Lord, we know that this is not normal for us, but it is our new normal for the right now. Father, we know that you are moving in the midst of your people. You are moving across this land. You are moving across this world. You are turning things upside down. What the enemy meant for evil, you are going to turn it around for good. I am believing and praying for the revival to hit this land like we've never seen it in our days. So, Father God, I pray for healing for the people who are watching today, that they will know right now that right where they stand, if they have an issue in their body, they can raise it up to you, and you will heal them in the mighty name of Jesus. Father God, I pray for those that are hurting because they, they just don't know how to handle this, Father, that they know that they have you, that they have you to turn to, and they can just, they can make it one day at a time because they have you, Lord Jesus. Have your way in this service. Have your way in everything that we do, everything that we say, every song that we sing. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us. Let it rise.
at this point in time with this virus that is still prevalent in America. God, we give it to you. We pray, Lord, that that would be gone in Jesus' name. Supernaturally, Lord, move across the globe with your healing power, with your restoration for those who are sick, those who are infirmed, those that are struggling for breath itself today. We speak life and health in Jesus' name. I thank you, God, Lord, that you know our needs. And for those that are sheltering in place, Lord, there are, I'm sure, more needs than, than what we've even seen coming in across this Facebook today. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, God, for meeting our needs. 
I thank you for restoration for families in this time of need, where we have time to reflect on what's important. We have extra time together with family and, and with those. I, I'm in agreement today, that one prayer request that came in, Junior, I'm praying with you. Lord, that there would be restoration within your family, between your sister and your mom. Lord, in Jesus' name, we just speak health in that relationship. And Lord, that that would happen quickly. Heavenly Father, I thank you for meeting the needs, for physical needs of those that are calling upon you today. Lord, we trust you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, you are the God that heals, the God that provides. And we thank you, Lord, for meeting those needs according to your riches and glory. We worship you today, Lord. Thank you, God, for your sovereignty and for your majesty and your faithfulness that we can trust in you no matter what. We ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you this morning. Again, welcome to um, uh, this online uh, church service. Eagle Mountain Assembly of God, uh, for those who uh, may not be familiar, because we see a lot of names of people that uh, uh, we may not see on a regular given Sunday when we have the doors open and, and um, uh, people are here. Um, uh, my name is Pastor Joel. I'm the youth pastor here, and Pastor Darren will be here shortly. I know for some of you, you may be saying, I know that guy. I see him at family reunions. Uh, just a little story. My wife at home with our family. Hi, Jeannie. Hi, uh, Hudson. Hi, Hope. Um, <laughs> I'm watching on Facebook. And they do a watch party. And we talked a little bit about this last week. And I've seen others doing watch parties. It's a simple thing. If you're on Facebook, look for the icon that says, start a watch party. And when you do that, it kind of lets your friends and Facebook know that you're doing something special. And they may join. And uh, my wife said, uh, before she knew it, she had about 40 people in her watch party party. And people from uh, from my side of the family, um, from Florida, from my aunt was watching, and cousins and second cousins, and uh, I know this morning uh, my uh, nephew is watching, and uh, it's a very cool thing just to start a watch party. Uh, people are getting connected to God during this time. I really believe it. I think that um, um, a T-shirt that I saw online uh, sums it up pretty well. It said, you know how uh, the statement. Elvis has left the building. It simply said, the church has left the building. <laughs> and that's true. We have church service and we miss that. And we can't wait to get back to fill these pews and to, to see people. And uh, we're prayerfully uh, um, watching with the state of Illinois when we can do that and hopefully uh, integrating that back as we uh, get later into May. But um, um, for right now, the church, as we've always seen uh, in Scripture, is the body of Christ. It's the people. Church right now, the church is in a thousand different homes in and among this area, millions of different homes around the globe. And uh, the church is doing what the church was meant to do. Take the gospel of Jesus Christ, invite others through watch parties, through uh, just uh, connecting together. So I think God is at work. I know God is at work, even in the midst of uh, this circumstance. Romans 8, uh, 38 and 39 talks about neither death nor life nor things present or going through difficulty presently or things to come. We don't know when or how this is all going to unfold. Um, neither height nor depth can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That's true. And uh, Jesus is alive and uh, we celebrate him today. Thank you so much for uh, faithfully joining us today. Thank you for um, your uh, online and, and your tithing and your offerings and things that uh, um, you're doing each and every week that you would normally do as a part of uh, Eagle Mountain Assembly of God. Um, this morning, Pastor will be coming shortly. I believe that that uh, Sister Tara has a, um, a special that she's going to sing this morning. God bless you. My husband asked me to sing this today. It's one of my daddy's favorite songs too. And my, my daddy turned 74 yesterday. 
will say it was my first birthday that I did not hug my daddy in 42 years. Now let me tell you, that was a little tough on me. But you know, I got to see him from afar. And uh, I'm going to see him again this afternoon, even if it is just from a little bit of a distance. He's there. So, you know, even though we think it's a little tough right now because we're not doing things as we normally would do it. God has such a plan to work through this. And it's okay, you know, usually I'm the person that gets up and I'm always saying, hey, life is great. We're just, we're just making it. We're doing it. We can do this. The last couple of days, I was kind of reaching out for people to say, you can do this. Because I was feeling sorry for myself because I couldn't hug my daddy. Because that's a big deal for me. And I may have cried a lot of tears. But God was in it with me the whole time. church family and friends that are joining us all across uh, cyberspace we are glad that you are with us today and uh, it's really hard to believe that uh, Easter was just two Sundays ago isn't that kind of kind of odd to think it's like we're in a sort of a time warp I think that uh, everything is just kind of off kilter but it's Sunday sometimes we need to remind ourselves what day of the week it is right it's Sunday it's the Lord's Day the first day of the week and so uh, thank you for making uh, 
uh, a point to join us today. I, uh, I was hoping that this morning that our presentation uh, digitally would be stronger than it is. We were supposed to get an upgrade from Mediacom this week, and for whatever reason, they never came through for us. So uh, thank you for your patience. I know we stutter and hand motions are blurry, but uh, bear with us, and uh, I think we're a little better than we were last week, but uh, next Sunday we should have things up to speed, I trust and pray. Well, I hope you guys are doing all right. I've talked to some of you, I've messaged some of you, and I've seen a couple of you here and there, and I uh, just want you to know that I am thinking of you all and praying for you. If you need somebody to talk to, give me a call. I'd be glad to chat with you and, uh, and just connect that way. I've also kind of put it out there that if there's enough people interested in doing a Zoom Bible study, that uh, that's something that I would be happy to facilitate if you're interested. Uh, we could do a men's breakfast kind of a devotion, you know, men's breakfast minus the breakfast, but it would still, it could still be a, a, a good time. So um, if there's people out there that are interested, I would love to hear from you. Give me a text or send me an email because we're just trying to find Find ways that we can connect with you. Uh, we don't want you to feel alone. We want you to know you're part of a church family and your church family is still here. And one of these days, we're going to get back together. Um, boy, it's hard to believe that we've got five more weeks of all this in front of us. But uh, I believe God will give us grace. It's an opportunity to grow and to focus on things that maybe in the busyness of life we've not been able to do. So this morning I uh, have a message that I, I feel will be helpful as we kind of focus. Um, it's so easy to get out of focus, especially when our routines are broken. And so um, reflect back um, Two weeks ago, we talked about the resurrection of Jesus and how that impacted our present lives. We talked about how we've got a sense of purpose, how Jesus lives in us, and how we have overcome the fear of death, and those are huge things. And then last week, I explored the resurrection a little more, and I gave you three resurrection facts, if you remember that. We talked about how everybody lives forever. We've all been made to be immortal. We talked about how everybody gets resurrected. There's coming a resurrection day. Even for those who want nothing to do with God, uh, there's still going to be a resurrection, uh, the Bible says. And then lastly, we said that everybody is going to get an opportunity to meet God face to face. I love that verse in Philippians where it says that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that tells me you've got a choice. You can, you can confess Jesus in this life by choice, or you will confess him at the end, but either way, you're going to recognize Jesus Christ as Lord. So in light of the fact that we are going to meet with God, I would think that it would be good to be prepared for that. Sort of like, you know, we, we, we understand there's definitely a final exam, right? Wouldn't it be kind of nice to know what's on that exam and to be able to be prepared for that? Uh, I would like that. I like being prepared for stuff. And so um, what's going to be on that exam? Well, the, the first thing, the most important thing, of course, is what did you do in this earthly life with Jesus? And uh, I'm just going to leave that right there for now and come back to that at the end. But beyond that, the, uh, the Bible does give us some very specific and clear guidance about what it is that God expects, what it is that pleases God, so that we can live in this life doing now what needs to be done in preparation for forever. Does that make sense? You know, if we know we're going to live forever, we know we're going to answer for our lives, it would be smart to live the kind of life that pleases God. And you may have had a lot of time to think about that. You know, what is my life all about? What's going on? What am I doing? <clears throat> I know this is kind of a, a heavy question. I know a lot of people are simply wrestling with, what day of the week is it? And, and what is it I should be doing this morning? Uh, you know, our, kind of our schedule's been thrown to the wind. And, and so I, to talk about, well, what should I be doing in light of eternity? That seems like a big question. But... Maybe you're wired differently than me, but when my life in the small picture is fuzzy, you know, there's 
confusion, routines are not what they used to be. And it, it just helps me to step back a little bit and, and get the big picture of what's going on in life and what is it that, that really matters. So uh, when I don't know what to do, it helps to reflect back on the bottom line. What is the bottom line of my life? The title of this message is, What Should I Be Doing Now? So I want to give you some direction from the Bible about what you can be doing with your time now that God would, at the end of your life, be able to look at you and say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I think that's what we're all living to hear, isn't it? We're, we're living to hear Jesus, Father God, look at us and say, Well done, thou faithful servant. And so um, one of my go-to verses is, uh, is found in the little book of Micah. And, and I love this verse because it's really simple. <laughs> Maybe I just like simple things more than the average guy, but I like to do things that I can remember. And this little verse in Micah is something I've always been able to remember. It, it doesn't hurt that at one time there was a song we used to sing that encompassed this verse. Did you know you can memorize scripture better if it's set to music? Just a little thought there. But uh, this, this verse clearly outlines what God expects of us. Okay? It's simple, it's straightforward, and I believe it's very powerful. The little book of Micah. Micah's a prophet. He's somebody who speaks for God. He's somebody that delivers God's message to God's people. And so Micah, in this verse I'm going to read, uh, he, is, he is God's voice. So um, the context of this is that um, Micah is talking about what does it take to please God? You know, can I, can I offer a sacrifice? Is that what makes God happy? What, what's it going to take? And, and it comes down to Micah chapter 6, and you probably knew where I was going, you Bible scholars out there, verse 8. And here's the simple passage about what we should be doing right now. He has showed you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? Come on now, you know this. To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Boy, there's three points, isn't there? Imagine that. I love those three pointers that just jump out at me. It makes it a whole lot easier to put my sermon together. So I want to give you three simple commands here that if you will live your life by these three things, at the end of your life, you will please God. So the first is to act justly. You know, if you were to read through the book of Micah and some of Micah's other prophetic contemporaries, you would know that uh, it was a difficult time. Uh, there was a lot of injustice. And, you know, really that never changes. There's always injustice. There's people with power and with influence and with money who can use that to take advantage of people who don't have power and don't have influence and don't have money. I mean, it, it's, it's just a part of the reality of our world. So there was thievery and there was lying and there was violence and Micah's talking to God about all these things and, you know, just like, God, you know, when are you going to do something about all this? And and so he comes around to saying to God, you know, what, what kind of religious things can we do to please God? And I think, you know, in times of crisis, people do tend to think a little more about religion as kind of a go-to to kind of get their life back in order again. But it's interesting that uh, the answer is not to be more religious How's that for a preacher telling you, don't be too religious? Uh, because it's not about religion. It's really about relationship. And in fact, um, this, this whole message is about relationship. So what does it mean to act justly? I think what, what Micah is saying here is, you know, if you want to get things going on with God, quit sinning and start treating people right. Newsflash. But, you know, it's like, 
we talked recently about how all people are created in the image and likeness of God. You can't mess with one of God's children without touching the heart of God. And if you've had the privilege of being a parent or a grandparent or just really loving anybody, you know that if somebody messes with one of your kids or somebody close to your heart, they are messing with your heart. And so God is, is saying here, treat people right do justly. So what does that mean? Well, it kind of goes back to what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6 and verse 31. He said, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Now, why does God expect us to act justly? I believe he asked us to do this because it's who he is. God is a God of justice. God treats people right. God treats people fairly. He is a God of his word. He is a God of integrity. And so he calls us to be like him. You know, we can never separate our responsibility to God from our responsibility to the people that God has put around us. It's our responsibility to, uh, to be God among the people that interact with us. People should see God in us. Now, that's a, that's a high calling, isn't it? But I'm going to step on some toes here in saying this. You could be in church every day. You could sing and shout and dance and give and read Scripture and quote Bible verses. But if you are not treating people right, you are far from the heart of God. See, it's not religion that, that moves God's heart. It's, it's doing right by people. It's treating them rightly. Doing justly is as is, is simple as being straight up about the used car you're selling. Right? We've all probably been on the wrong side of that equation before. Say, well, that's just the way it is. It shouldn't be that way if you're a Christian. Thought I heard somebody say amen. It's returning the found wallet, not looking at it as a blessing from God. <clears throat> it's really working when you're on the clock. It's, it's being full of integrity when you give your word. You really mean what you really say, and if you say you'll do it, you'll do it. These are just all examples of, of what it looks like to do justly. It's doing your own homework. It's refusing to pass on a bit of juicy gossip. It's being kind to people. Boy, if there's ever a day when we could use a little extra kindness, it's, it's right now, isn't it? Being kind just treating people the way you would want to be treated. You know, every time we fail to do justly, we've lost a little bit of credibility in the eyes of the world to whom we are trying to show Jesus. And if you don't think people are watching, just make a couple of mistakes and you'll know about it. People do watch us. They look at us. And a follower of Jesus will treat people justly, even in the midst of lockdown. And can I put a little P.S. in there? It includes the people you're locked down with. You don't get a pass on those people. So we love, we do justly. But secondly, God tells us we are to love mercy. And this has to do with our dealings with people, but it's from a different angle. Loving mercy is how we respond to people when they don't do justly to us. Anybody know anything about that? When people don't treat us justly, how do we respond? Well, God says we are to love mercy. Now, why does God say that? Well, aren't you glad for Psalm 103 where it tells us that God does not treat us as our sins deserve? Can we give a big shout out and say thank you, Jesus, for that? Because I sure don't want God to treat me the way my sins deserve. And therefore, he calls me to not treat other people the way their sins might deserve. Notice that God says that we are to love mercy. You know, there's a lot of people that don't really 
have any problem with doing justly. They are big justice people. Let's do it right. Let's, let's make sure we play by the rules. And they're really big on justness and rightness. But some of those people can be the hardest people on people that fail, people that let them down. And it is especially those who love justice who also need to step back and say it needs to be balanced by loving mercy as well. I like how it doesn't say do mercy, it says love mercy. And I think there's a difference. You know, you can give a begrudging to somebody, okay, Buster, I'll forgive you this time, but you watch out. You better not treat me like that again, or it's going to be bad for you. Uh, don't make me do something I'm going to regret. Uh, you know, that, that's really not loving mercy. Loving mercy is, is turning the other cheek when we get offended. It's still wishing good for our enemies. Ooh. Boy, that's tough, isn't it? Wishing good for our enemies. We treat people who have let us down the way we ourselves would want to be treated if the shoe were on the other foot. You know, these are hard things. In fact, I'm pretty well convinced that loving mercy is harder than, than doing justly. Because when you have an issue where you've been offended, you've now got what? Emotions involved. You feel it. It's not just something in your head. It's something you feel. And the command here is to love mercy, to, to be willing to give, can I say that word? Give grace. Be gracious with those people who don't treat you justly. Remember that so many of the things that we get really bent out of shape with, when it comes to the eternal perspective, it doesn't really matter anyway. So many things that, that just get us in a twist are things that really, you know, in a year or two, you may not even remember that it happened unless you really work at it. And some people do that. But don't be one of those people. Loving mercy is... Um, is choosing to forgive people. It's choosing to not get bitter. It's choosing not to hold a grudge. Can I just put in a little aside here? If you will choose to love mercy, you will have a happier life, and the people around you will be happier too. Nobody has a better life because they choose to hold on to anger, bitterness, and grudges. You know, I believe God gives us commands like this because He really wants to help us. He's not telling us what to do because He knows it's hard. He's telling us what to do because He knows it's right. And it'll give us the best possible life outcome. Now, understand this, that if you love mercy, there's going to be people that are going to misunderstand you. There's going to be people that are going to accuse you of being a doormat. They're going to tell you, you know, you shouldn't stand for that. There's going to be people that are going to criticize you. You may be discredited, but that's okay. We don't answer to those people. Can I get an amen out of that? We don't answer to people for the way we conduct ourselves. We live life with the mindset, I'm going to meet with God someday, and I'm going to have to answer. Well, now this is, this is meddling here, but we're not just going to have to answer for what we have done. But we are also going to have to answer for what we have thought. Whew. Okay, would you like to have an altar call right now? Let's just all bow. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I love that passage in Psalm where it says, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O God, my rock and my redeemer. You know what? If you think justice and mercy you are much more likely to do justice and mercy. Don't think that you can fill your head with all kinds of injustice and merciless thinking, and then you're just going to be able to turn around and be just and merciful. You're not, because our minds direct our words and our actions. So, do justly. Love mercy. And then, lastly, Walk humbly with your God. This is what gives us the strength to do the first two, because honestly, we can't do it on our own. To treat people right, to be able to forgive and give grace to people that have hurt us, those are unnatural things. But God helps us. You know, when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your life gets a course change. And it's a good course change. And it's like you were walking one way, 
And repent really basically means to just do an about face and walk the other way, to follow Jesus, to walk with him, to do a 180 for, from where you were going and how you wanted to live your life to following Jesus. So if somebody is testifying, don't tell anybody you've done a 360 for Jesus, okay? Because that just means you're right back where you started. Do a 180, okay? Do a 180 for Jesus, where you are going the opposite way that you were, you were going. So the walk with God begins with Jesus, and I'll say more at the end, which is coming. But, you know, everybody's walk with God is personal and unique. But there is one thing in common with every relationship that you and I have. It requires an investment on our parts. You cannot have a successful relationship if you have not invested in that relationship. I think it's one of the great side effects of the shelter in place order that we are under is that we do have time to invest in key people. I know Mary Ann and I, we've been having some wonderful time. We're, we're both kind of introverts by nature and uh, we kind of look at each other and think, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good too. I don't want to say too much, but I kind of like some of this, you know, it's, it's okay uh, because I get to spend time with my favorite person and invest time with her and it's been really sweet. So we do have an opportunity to invest in the people that are closest to us and we need to do that but we also need to invest in a relationship with God. You can't walk humbly with God without spending time with Him. Praying, reading the Word, worshiping, listening to worship music, meditating. Uh, meditating is kind of a lost art. I maybe need to preach on that sometime. But uh, you know, just making God the center of your attention. And so every successful relationship comes because we've made an investment. And I, I think I'm optimistic for the church as we go through this time because a lot of the fluff of our lives has been sheared off. We've been kind of trimmed back to some essentials. Things we used to give a lot of time and attention to, we can't do those things anymore. And so now we've been forced to kind of focus on what's most important. And we've recognized that it's the key people in our lives. And hopefully you've also made the discovery that you need God. You know, there is something totally humbling about the whole fact that a microscopic little virus that we can't even begin to see has put our whole economy in a tailspin, not just in the United States, but around the world. And man, with all of his wisdom, can't do anything to get free from this for right now. And that's really humbling, and it tells us how important it is that we have our, a God relationship. Humility always looks good on people. As we walk humbly with God, it's going to make us an easier person to live with. Now let me warn you of one shelter-in-place pitfall in your walk with God, and that is that social media can really trip you up. You know, too much looking around on social media can make you feel like somehow you're missing out or you're not enough. Uh, there's something wrong with you and you start asking questions about why this and why that. And, you know, social media is great and I'm spending a lot of time on Facebook, hopefully not too much time, uh, but I may be. Uh, but the fact is, we, we, that's our window. It's our window to the world. But we have to remember that, that in a walk with God, everybody's pace and everybody's path is unique. You know, if God wanted you to be older or younger or married or single or, or have this standard of living or that, you know, God could have brought all that together for you. You are where you are by one, choices you've made, but two, I believe God's got a plan. He, he's ordained our paths from, from birth. And so... Don't take your life cues from the people you see on social media. If there's something to learn, great, enjoy that. But remember that it is God who's leading the walk, right? We are walking humbly with Him. So I want to give you just a, a word of exhortation here in this, and that is take time to ask God, what should I be doing now? 
And that's a simple question. What should I be doing now? And then believe God to answer that. Read your Bible. Pray. Meditate. I believe God will speak to you. If you're really going through a hardship in this time of, of, of quarantine, ask God, God, what do I need to be doing right now? How do I need to be investing my life? And I believe that God will show you and make that plain. So we want to invest. We want to develop spiritual ears to hear from God. So what does God expect? Well, he wants us to do justly, to treat people right. He wants us to love mercy. He wants us to give grace and forgive and treat people who've offended us the way we would want to be treated if the shoe was on the other foot. And God wants us to get close to him and walk humbly with him. That's what God expects. That's what's going to be on the final exam. But there's a problem. And the problem is is that as we look at our lives, we have not always done justly, we have not always loved mercy, and we have certainly not always walked humbly with God. You know, I've, I've often thought, I wish there was a statute of limitations on past offenses. You know, where it's like after so many years, yeah, they don't exist. <laughs> My last few years haven't been too bad, but there's a few years back there I'd really like to erase. But you know what? That's not what we're given. The Bible says, and I've talked about this uh, last Sunday, that uh, there's books in heaven that record the contents of our life. And just as there's good works recorded, there's also the times that we have been anything but just. We've been selfish. We've been anything but merciful. We've been revengeful. Uh, you know, these things are noted on the record of our lives. And so when we come to that time, when we do meet with God, you know what? We are all going to stand there with our heads hung low and we're going to say guilty is charged. And that's why I say we need Jesus. The most important question on the final exam is going to be, what did you do with Jesus? Because you will never be just enough, you will never be merciful enough, and you will never walk closely with God enough so that your life is free from offense. That's why we need Jesus. On that cross, Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. He took our death sentence when he died so that we could have the gift of eternal life. When Jesus died on the cross, I can look every one of you in the eye and say, Jesus died for you. But you know, if you don't believe that, if you don't accept that pardon personally, if you don't go to Jesus and ask him to forgive you of your sins and give you the gift of eternal life, then you've not been redeemed. You've not passed from death to life. There is a moment where every person needs to deal with Jesus and I would much prefer to do it in this life than in the next life when we stand before him guilty and it's too late. Say, so, well, how, what does it take to be a Christian? How do I ask Jesus into my heart? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's real easy. It's A, B, C. A, admit that you're a sinner. Admit that you need a Savior. B, believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He died for you. He paid that penalty. Believe that. And then see, confess Jesus Christ as Lord. You can pray a simple prayer that says basically, Jesus, I believe. I admit I, I am a sinner. I stand guilty. I've not been just. I've not been merciful. I've not been obedient. I need a Savior. I believe, Jesus, that you died for me. And I now confess that you are my Lord and Savior. If you'll pray that prayer today, then I'm going to pray with you in just a moment. I'm going to ask that you would just, on the comments there, on your Facebook page, just write in there, I prayed. Would you do that? I prayed. And then I'll get back with you in a message and just share a couple things with you. But I'd love to hear some feedback from people this morning. So let's pray this prayer together. If you're a Christian, you can pray this prayer. If you've never followed Jesus, pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I admit that I am a sinner. I admit that I have broken the rules. I've been disobedient to your commands. 
But I believe that on the cross, Jesus died so that I could have life. I believe he paid my death penalty to purchase my pardon to, so that I could be delivered from my record of wrong. And I now confess that I am a follower of Jesus. I confess that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, please let me know. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for being with us today. Tara's going to close us out with one last song and with prayer.